Okay, welcome, Len, and um, glad you can give this presentation today. And so, please uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for uh, g giving us blue jeans. And uh, in the audience here, we have somebody all the way from uh, Austria, and that's wonderful. Um, I've broken up the usual unbroken sequence of systems origins, which I've been working on since 1972. Um, when I presented my first paper to IEEE, so I'm not going to go through that uh, uh, history, uh, and then presented as a courses at UC San Diego, and also a whole series of courses at my Cal Poly Pomona for about 40 years. I'm just going to give well, you the highlights of systems origins now. So uh, it says towards a, theor a theory of emergence, but that comes as the second item after we go through the details of an unbroken sequence of systems origins. And in the upper left-hand corner, that logo is for the Institute for Advanced System Studies that uh, I had for many years before I retired. So this really is about the continuous integration diversification cycles that uh, stand for almost everything in the universe in terms of being a system. And so we're trying to show that both natural and social systems originate by the same rules and patterns, and so are unified or integrated by those processes. And in fact, there's an algorithm, the ID algorithm, that uh, actually could explain all of them. And that's what I'm trying to get at as a theory of emergence. But I can't get there unless I first explain the ID cycle. So this first part uh, on YouTube is about explaining the ID cycles. So. The next part of the talk will be, uh, well, actually, this part of the talk is the uh, integration and diversification processes that go across 14 billion years. And uh, the innovation here is that we talk about them as unbroken. So as I go through each new origination of a new type of system in the universe, I can associate it with a time that we know that that probably occurred from our experiments. and several of the mechanisms by which one systems level could give a rise to the next. That's the important thing here. I use reductionist science to show holistic science uh, the pathway that's unbroken. And uh, this cannot be done in the individual sciences. It has to be transdisciplinary because otherwise you can't see something becoming something else. Um, my first paper was in 1972, and I've had papers in the 70s and 80s and uh, abstracts, uh, that, but unfortunately, they're for the IEEE, and so many of them are not available. So later on, I'll highlight the emergence works. I gave 10 lectures on this at the University of Vienna in 1985. My incoming president's plenary was on this uh, in 90, 1989 in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I gave it as a president's plenary in Östersund, Sweden. Um, and then I've had a whole series of papers uh, on theory of emergence in IEEE, not just uh, 04 there. Also, I was invited to the Center for Complex Systems, the University of Alaska in, in uh, at, that should, it says Fairbanks there, but it should say Anchorage. It was the University of Alaska at Anchorage. And virtually it's the same PowerPoints I'm showing now. So. Up to, from 1972 to now, there's been about 20 total works, and I should compare them with Morowitz and other people's works like Tyler Volk, and I have done that in the Systems Education YouTube. This was my first paper for the IEEE in 1972, and it already showed going from galaxies and astronomical systems, as you can see, all the way through all the biological systems levels, all the way up to social hierarchies. So, the emergent levels I define as the appearance of a new level of system or complexity of system somewhere in the universe. And we can put a timeline on that. Um, and I'm thinking now that it's really due to statistical thermodynamics that we keep getting the same uh, 40 or 50 isomorphies as processes, no matter what the system is. So I've said for many years, it seems like, and in fact, if you see John Barrow's uh, physics books, he kind of goes through this and shows in terms of uh, log uh, charts of 
the smallest things to the biggest things in the universe, he shows basically that uh, actually nature has been uh, kind of, I say, nature has been throwing off the same system over and over again, the uh, isomorphic system, but at different levels from different parts at different times. And that's what we're gonna basically go through. I start with an ironic quotation from Darwin, who of course discovered the theory of evolution and the origin of species. He said at one time in one of his books, it is mere rubbish thinking at present of the origins of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. And he was making a joke out of it that we couldn't think about origins of life any more than we could think about the mystery of the origins of matter. Well, nowadays we think about both of those because 140 years later, we have a series of explanations of the possibility of one level giving rise to the other. And that's what this is about. Now the conventional thinking um, that's not systems thinking, uh, the reductionist uh, way or Bible uh, of thinking is that physical systems are completely different from living systems, are completely different from human or conscious systems. And this actually shows that that is not true. That was an error just like it was an error to think that the earth was flat at one time or that entities in astronomy are not spherical. So we'll show the error of perception due to the lack of knowledge in the following series. And we'll show empirical evidence for each uh, emergent new level using the methods, techniques, and instruments of each of the sciences involved. So in terms of biochemistry or astronomy, we'll be using their methods, techniques, and instruments. So this should be, even though it's going across all the sciences, this should be acceptable to the conventional sciences because it's using their mechanisms. It's peer reviewed and it's the consensus for that domain. So the evidence explains how one level emerges naturally from the last level uh, by knowable or measurable uh, processes and demonstrates behaviors of entities on the previous level lead to the interactions making the next. So we think that even reductionist scientists should not see a distinction between the integration and divergence events as we're doing in the systems processes theory. Uh, most stick to the mechanics on one level. And in fact, the science demands it because of the methodology of the scientific method. You can't go beyond uh, and make hypotheses beyond your entities and the particulars you're studying. Uh, that's actually a no-no, and I've been criticized for it in the past in a lot of uh, cell biology and cell and molecular biology. Now look at this slide. This uh, captures several of the integration. Um, I have here fragmentation because it's old slides. It should be Ds every place you see Fs. That uh, this actually explains literally all of the levels of systems that we know of and all of the phenomena in all of the conventional sciences in one slide. How's that for unification? And if you look at it, you see that uh, the, it even goes beyond the unification of the conventional sciences because it shows that it's always the same kind of cycle that's involved or alternatives in the cycle. And we're about to show that. So this, of course, has as an element this diagram. And what is this diagram? In the upper part of the cycle, there are arrows that flow inward. You notice if you can see um, the arrowheads and look at the dark part, you see these are um, an icon I use for integration. They uh, flow inward. And this means that the entities at that level of systems are coming together or integrating into a new architecture. But in the lower part of the cycle, and notice that there's a connecting line here, because of the integration, there's a new level of reality that can then, uh, you could say fragment, but I like the better word diversification. And it's quite natural for nature. You know, you've heard the statement, nature abhors a vacuum. Nature abhors a singularity in that sense. And in fact, when a new integration and a new architecture appears, it begins to diversify because of statistical variations 
into many, many different things. So in the lower part of the cycle, arrows emerge outward, and this represents this divergence or fragmentation. So we say that there's a number of integrations that then are followed by uh, diversifications, which then become the basis for the new integration. So this actually gives rise to this, or this was dependent on the last diversification, and they're connected all the way up the system's levels, and both are connected by this theory of emergence. Well, I'll see, I'll show 70 such integration diversification events in this particular talk. I'm not attached in any way to the 70. Um, in fact, at the end, I got tired of it on the human level because there were so many diversifications beyond language and uh, theories that um, I just quit. <laughs> so there's probably a lot more than 70 innovation or integration diversification events, um, and I'm not attached to the number at all. The point is to show that physical systems actually give rise to living systems and those to conscious and social systems, and that it's an error to think that those things are separated uh, at all. Uh, it's just because we're conscious beings and we want to think we're special. So each new integration is an emergent level and creates a new size scale of object and type in the universe. Now, you know uh, that Santa Fe Institute are a bunch of good scientists, and they still kind of do reductionist systems work though, and the past director of it, the recent director, uh, who is now no longer the director, just came out with a book called Scalar, and he talks mostly about allometries of scale, and I've done a lot of research in that too, but he doesn't talk about systems allometry. This is systems allometry and systems emergence. To me, each emergent event is what I call a capital E event. Because a lot of systems people say that there, to them, emergence is the appearance of a new quality or uh, an unpredicted uh, eventuality. And so they say something like hydrogen and oxygen getting together to water. You can't predict exactly the qualities and features of water molecules based on looking at just hydrogen and oxygen. Um, you just can't predict, and so it's an emergent thing. I'm talking about emergence of all compounds from all elements, and that's the, what I call a big E event that leads to a whole new uh, level of thing. So in terms of the unbroken sequence, uh, I've now modified it to always call it USSO, the unbroken sequence of systems origins, because I want to emphasize that we're not talking about a series of origins just, say, in biology, or a series of origins in geology, or a series of origins in astronomy. I'm talking about abstracting to the level of systems origins, and that's what I call emergence. And we could go by the old data and say it's 13.6 billion years ago that you're talking about the sequence of these origins. So. I think I've beaten to death the concept that emergence usually results in a new scale of size of object based on new parts and new mechanics. So why do we say unbroken sequence? Because the next level always emerges from the last by natural mechanisms, by its own internal characteristics. It blossoms out, if you can say so. So that's why I say that the universe keeps giving rise to the same system over and over again uh, at different scales uh, and with different mechanics uh, for each scale, but when you abstract the same mechanics, and that's why you get isomorphies la later. You can explain how our universe of objects came to be, and this is quite different from the complex systems group's idea of emergence, such as Kaufman and Morowitz's, because they're dealing with uh, only origins at their particular level. So uh, this leads to the the second half of this talk, which is the next time we get together tomorrow, a special empirical theory of emergence, uh, which is really, really exciting to me because the theory of evolution became very significant. You would think the theory of emergence, which talks about all systems originating instead of just species, 
would be even a, a bigger story, right? And it comes only from systems theory. So now let's start with the unbroken sequence of origins. Just as an illustration, I'll start with the physical system series. And see in this diagram, you get the basic integration, uh, diversification, integration, diversification, and so on, right? Every place there's an asterisk here, I'm actually going to talk about uh, the data from that particular discipline that indicates how the integration uh, occurred and how it gives rise to the uh, diversification, okay? Now to do that, I've got to uh, actually click on this uh, integration. So the very first one, the origins and types of universe, uh, we can look at the, the research that's been done on that. Now, I'm sitting in the Wilson international business office for the ISSP here. And Wilson himself was disagreed with the Big Bang Theory, but it's a consensus right now. Lemaitre uh, in 1931 hypothesized that Gamov again in 1946, and it would say that there was a, an event about 13.4 billion years ago. And uh, there was something, and we, we can't call it matter. There was a, a Gamow called it Elim, just to give it a different name. It was about 200 million miles wide by the mathematical calculations, but it was not matter. It was of unknown physics. It exploded and expanded rapidly. And as you know, later on, um, inflation became a part of this theory. And basically it follows E equals MC squared, the uh, basic uh, fundamental uh, simplification of Einstein's theory. And that is that energy and matter are in fact transforms of each other. And in the beginning, it was all energy at 10 to the minus 34 seconds. Now just think of that, that means a second divided up into 34 uh, log parts. That means uh, to the uh, I mean, to the log level of 34 zeros uh, before you get the one. Um, but energy naturally started to cool. And in the bottom right here are all different kinds of hypotheses about the actual structure of the universe at that early point in time. Um, I think one of these guys is Gamov down here. So energy cools naturally and causes condensation um, as the space expands and that allowed matter to form. So matter is not stable until cool enough. As the size doubles, the temperature halves in terms of the mathematics of the Big Bang Theory. And so the diversification or the IF cycle comes from the energy cooling and different states of matter forming. Now, there are three fundamental observations empirically that tell us uh, about this. So how do we know this, uh, this occurs? One of them is the Doppler sound effect, which Doppler came up with in 1842. And he actually got this from listening to a band as it approached and went away from his position, a standing position uh, on a train. Uh, but even a little child, when he's, he's playing about cars, you know, will go and make this sound. Yum, right? That yum is literally the Doppler effect. When sound is coming toward you, the oscillation and the vibrations of the sound are closer together, uh, the uh, frequency is higher, and so it makes a higher sound. But when it's going away from you, the oscillations are stretched out, the waves are stretched out, and you hear a lower sound. Well, Hubble uh, actually transferred the Doppler sound effect to the redshift, which was light from the galaxies, and he said the shifts were increasing uh, were increasing proportional to the distance from us because they were traveling away from us. And he calculated back to the still point uh, and corrected for gravitation. And that would mean the universe. Uh, and so the light we're receiving now was 13.4 billion years old. Recently, they've changed this because this became actually a constant, the Hubble constant, 15 kilometers per second per million light years of traveling away from us. So 
The red shift was all things were traveling away from us as a source. But that's not the only empirical observation because the background radiation was predicted from this. Gamma predicted a five degree Kelvin leftover radiation in 1948 with his mathematics. Gamma was an incredible guy. I'm reading a very three inch thick autobiography of his right now. And of course the Kelvin scale, remember, goes down to minus 273 degrees centigrade. So it's a different scale than you're used to either centigrade or Fahrenheit. Hoyle and Russians made the same prediction in 1964, quite a few years later uh, using the mathematics. But in 1964, at the same time that the mathematics was going around as a prediction, there was actually an observation by Penzias and Wilson who are shown here with a radio telescope. And with the radio telescope, they saw this kind of picture uh, uh, surrounding us, which is kind of a leftover uh, background radiation. Uh, so they demonstrated the existence of a 3.5 degree Kelvin uniform background. And this shows the magic of when uh, theory or mathematics and experiments combined. They got the Nobel Prize for it. Gamow and Hoyle and the Russians, of course, did not because uh, they were just doing uh, theoretical things. And the third uh, way of looking at this, how do we know, is actually looking at gravitational collapse and models. And these are three different models of the beginning. This is the Big Bang. And you can see that you get clusters of galaxies at the end. And it was Wilson, whose office I'm sitting in right now, uh, his PhD mentor was Fritz Zwicky at Caltech. And he and Peebles in recent times have shown the gravitational collapse, not just in the model, has resulted in uneven clumps in the universe of clusters of clusters of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So things get clumpy. Incidentally, I recently, by uh, researching fractals, have seen that Benoit Mandelbrot claims that it's not clustered hierarchically, that it's actually a fractal structure. Uh, and I have yet to uh, uh, examine that better. But in any point, this clustering is matches pretty much what we see, both in the terms of the background radiation and in terms, so it, it gives uh, support to the concept of um, the origins of the universe uh, being spontaneous. And nowadays, of course, we talk about there being 10 to the 500 universes. Uh, this might be ours with its clusters of galaxies, but there might be other types. This is mathematically unproven at this particular point. This particular symbol gets us back to our original origin of the cosmos. So now we can talk about quark formation. Whoops, I went too fast there. I'm supposed to go on integration. So the universe as the Big Bang uh, started diversifying into all kinds of div uh, astronomical ob objects. But at the same time, these were happening on the macroscopic scale. Something was happening on the micro, actually sub-microscopic uh, uh, scale. And that was types of quarks. And so 10 to the minus 35 seconds from the zero time, the, the universe had cooled enough to uh, form quarks and six different types of quarks formed. And it's important to think of the quarks as popping in and out of existence, existence at this point in time, because remember the universe is very hot and very small at this particular time. So it's very dependent on the context uh, or the environment of the particles and the position in the sequence they are of things forming uh, into larger things. As things uh, cool down in energy, then higher and higher complexes are capable of forming in our entropic universe. And this is an artist's picture of quarks uh, forming into larger complexes. It actually is an artist's version of what they see in the particle accelerators. So there's experimentation work on the quark level uh, too. 
And then the next thing is the formation of hadrons. I've got to go through this a little bit more quickly, although we've only been talking about half an hour, and I hope that you see that I'm trying to take from the reductionist sciences sufficient alternatives. This becomes very clear when you get to the origins of cell and the first biochemistry. Uh, different ways that the universe uh, forms new scalar objects. Again, now 10 to the minus 10 seconds from zero. This is a long time after zero because it only has 10 zeros before the one or the fractions of a second. We're now at below 100 billion uh, billions of degrees centigrade. So things have uh, cooled enough that the quarks can begin to get together. Uh, in other words, the heat around them is not so great that it blows them apart so that uh, higher and higher complexes can form. And we'll see this as a theme throughout ent entropic universe. As time goes by, greater and greater complexes can form. Um, the word complex in that sense is a, a much debated term. If you get two up and one down quark, you get a proton. If you get two down and one up, you get a neutron. And those become the nucleons, uh, which are called the hadrons. And so a whole family of hadrons emerge. And you see this is, after the integration because of the cooling, this is the family of elementary particles and their antiparticles over here. Uh, and you can see that there's 16 in each case. Uh, there's probably now 200 stable subatomic particles that begin to emerge, um, even more when you talk about supersymmetry. So in that particular case, you've now gotten the integration into larger complexes for atoms, but then their diversification immediately into different sets for the formation of had hadrons. So you get families of hadrons. And then you get the first atomic nuclei. Whoops, I went over that again. I've got to get the finger there. So as things cool down even more from one second to three minutes from zero, now we're getting into times we can understand and have some sense of. It's now only a billion degrees centigrade in the small universe. But during this time, uh, the energy is transforming still more to matter. Uh, and so in the Big Bang, 99.9% .9 of the universe becomes the simplest two elements, hydrogen and helium. Those are born from the uh, cooling off of the universe per se, as we're gonna see higher complexes into atoms take the stars to form. So 74% of the universe nowadays is still hydrogen, the simplest element formed as the universe cooled. I have a black thing here. I have, oh, that's, oh, I can move it. So, no, I can't move it entirely. Okay, the next uh, simulation, helium, about 25% of the mass is converted in the first few hundred seconds uh, of the universe. The universe is still too hot for any other atomic nuclei to form. And so, at this time, we go integration, fragmentation cycles to the next set where matter and radiation uh, change and join, and the first atoms begin to form. So here's uh, the actual subatomic particle interactions that give rise to helium from hydrogen and uh, a diagrammatic picture. Notice these are much more complex objects that were there than were there in the beginning. So 300,000 years from the zero point now, it's still 13.4 billion years ago, well, actually, with the new calculations and the change to the Hubble constant, it's a little bit less than that. Although I have to tell you, in my experience, for half a century, the time of the universe has increased uh, consistently across my 50 years. Uh, this is the first time it's actually gone a little bit backwards. Now we're only a few thousand degrees centigrade. So you can get spontaneous assembly of hydrogen and helium in open space. Electrons cannot join the nuclei. They're still popping in and out of existence. So the vast percentage of the universe is made from the simplest two elements, hydrogen and helium, in our current periodic table. Matter and energy decouple at this time, and you get aggregation into vast clouds called nebulae. Uh, it's kind of hydrogen-helium fog, if you will, uh, if you can imagine on that uh, galactic scale, cosmic scale, 
not our uh, fog on Earth. Um, but in any case, these nebulae are very important to the formation of the first astronomical objects in the highest level. Oh, okay, so first atoms form. Uh, let's talk about nebulae and clusters forming spontaneously. Well, remember that picture of the background radiation I showed you before? Uh, a lot of research has been done since then, and this is the modern, more modern picture uh, of the background radiation. As you can see, it's far more clustered and far more fine. Um, this is the latest baby picture of the universe that we can see. Um, it's the most detailed yet by uh, microwave satellite uh, information, uh, actually uh, in a place away from Earth that's in a stable uh, orbit. This is at the time when the first giant stars started, about 400,000 years from zero. From the nebulae, they condensed by gravitational uh, attraction to uh, more concentrated forms, which became the first stars. The first stars, incidentally, were huge compared to our star, and there's very few of them, but we can still see them back in the universe if we go back in time by getting light from uh, much more distant sources. So um, you can actually see these stars uh, are very unstable. They last very short amount of time. So the Big Bang afterglow was about 13.3 billion years ago. The temperature variation was one part in 100,000, and that's what's kind of showing here because of the background radiation. It resulted in clustering in the universe and this is why I disagree with Benoit Mandelbrot calling everything fractals. But, I mean, they might be fractals, and they're a hierarchy at the same time. It depends on what mathematics you're using to model them. Um, and essentially what you need is dark and visible matter. And we're still puzzling, of course, over the recent discovery that most of the universe is dark energy. We can't even see it. And a good part of it is dark matter. But you put those two together and you get 96% of the universe. Ordinary visible matter is just this little sliver here. And so we've been making all of our hypotheses on a, a very, very small piece of the universe, whether that's a consequence of all of this. And we don't understand how these are the foundation for this has yet to be seen. And I think systems theory is going to help uh, with this. So clumpiness is less than expected in, well, I shouldn't say clumpiness is less than expected. The reason they think there's this dark energy and dark matter is when they look at the gravitational attractions necessary to keep galaxies together and their speed of rotation, it doesn't match. There's something else there. There's a lot of uh, material that we just don't understand. And we, uh, to this point uh, of this discussion, have not understood what was there uh, that keeps these things rotating and keeps them together. Otherwise, the solar winds would blow the electrons off of the fog of hydrogen and helium, and you wouldn't get the um, clumpiness and the aggregation that you get uh, as a dominant feature of uh, astronomical objects forming for the first time. So this. It marks the beginning of the modern era of stars and galaxies and the clumpiness that we see nowadays. Whoops. Oh. No. So we're looking at the origins of clustering. I've included the origins of galaxies or proto-galaxies in the nebulae clustering ID cycle. Um, I could show them as separate things, and that would add to the 70 levels. That's why I say I'm not too uh, firm on the exact number. It's just that it's a very large number. The first mass of stars blew glass and fog away uh, in order to get formation of the aggregates within them. And incidentally, I can tell you from other uh, research that I've done that this is the beginnings of the word feedback in astronomy. The word feedback was never used before. And I wonder how it compares with our mathematics and engineering for the term feedback, because both for galaxies and stars, part of the formation of them is that they they create a huge storm in the local area, which blows away some of the particles, and then the other ones aggregate. 
So it happens on both the galactic and the stellar level. And from this, I can mention another thing. They, they now call them feedbacks in the titles of the articles. So I have some of those articles. And uh, that's the birth of the concept of feedback in astronomy, which wasn't used for many, many years. But it also shows another thing. If it happens on the, on the process of a star clearing out some of the stuff for the formation of a solar system, and it happens on the level of a galaxy core uh, blowing away uh, some of the matter so that uh, many different stars form at different sizes. Notice those are two different scales. And exactly that's what I did in teaching my origins course from the about 1975 to when I retired in 2008 or something. And that is, I told my students, there are many solar systems in the universe. Uh, at that time, saying that would have thrown me out of any astronomical uh, conference session. Why? Because I had no evidence for it. But from a system's point of view, I thought the following way. If a galaxy, I mean, if a solar system can form by rotation uh, and aggregation in our system, then there's probably many systems like that. And of course, since then, I've been uh, supported because we're, we're finding 200, 500 exoplanet or solar systems uh, since then. But you get the idea. Uh, this is an isomorphic idea that can only come from systems. If you can see something proven on one scalar level, it is likely that you have the same thing on another scalar level. That's a tremendously powerful thing for reductionist science to learn. And this is uh, an artist, uh, of course, uh, perception of the original case and then the feedback of the process being blown away so that you can get the aggregation of some of these objects without further in interference. The next thing shows a mapping of an incredible 170,000 galaxies. So we've progressed a lot. Uh, remember Darwin's statement that you might as well think about the origins of matter. We progressed a lot in terms of talking about and giving models of the origins of matter as well as species uh, and the origins of cells, uh, which I work in the origin of nuclei. So remember, a galaxy consists of billions of stars. So if there's 170,000 galaxies in this picture here, just imagine how many stars and solar systems there are. So each unresolvable dot in this picture contains uh, 1 billion, I think that is, of stars. This is the visible part of the universe. And remember, that was only a teeny tiny part because of dark matter and dark energy, which we haven't figured out yet. So going back to our integration uh, diversification cycles, I, I, I guess you can see that once you get different kinds of nebulae at different sizes, you're going to get an incredible different set of stars and galaxies, right? So fragmentation. But that fragmentation itself sets up the next integration, which is the different generations of stars. Let's look at that very quickly. Uh, I'm not through the first hour yet, so I'm going to continue with this. That's why I broke it up into uh, two different talks. So gases and nebula experience gravitational collapse, but it really depends on how many, uh, how big, and what the structure of the nebula is, and so you get diversification. So there's ever more massive aggregation of gases. The result is very high local temperatures and pressures uh, that result in the form of clusters of stars. And so here down in the bottom part is a star forming from a nebula, which we captured with the Hubble telescope. Some nebulae, the particles in nebulae, and actually that's after a supernova explosion, and we have these clusters of stars. The supernova explosion is very important because besides uh, being uh, an evidence for the diversification of different sizes of stars, it begins the next level because it spreads away or spreads around the higher elements, which we haven't gotten to yet. The recent discoveries show that the oldest known galaxies have a redshift of about seven 
And that means you're looking back in time when the universe was only 6% of its current age. And so you could look back in time by looking back in terms of redshifts in the universe as it is right now. Um, uh, and this is actually pictures, uh, uh, one of the Madonna galaxy was named by Wilson, whose uh, office I'm sitting in. And this is billions of individual and different stars in any one galaxy, billions of galaxies in the universe. It's just mind boggling. This is some nebulae that have stars forming in different places in them and uh, so are the other pictures. This is an actual photograph of what exists out there in astronomy, and I think these are artists' conceptions. So they ignite into third, second, and first generation stars, and I don't know why astronomers did this. I haven't asked an astronomer lately, but I, I should. Um, whoops. Uh, they named them backwards. So the biggest, oldest stars are the third generation. The second and the first generation are like our star, which are smaller and more stable. And uh, in the biggest stars, the primordial hydrogen and helium begin to form into heavier elements. And I actually talked with uh, Margaret Burbage, who was one of the authors of the cosmochemistry origins uh, in the stars of the higher elements. She was in my talk on unbroken sequence of systems origins. Uh, she gave a talk in my course at UC San Diego. Um, so the supernovae of earliest supermassive stars that had heavier elements forming within them, spread them across space. And so now you had nebulae, which didn't have just hydrogen and helium, but had some amounts of metals and the, the simple metals in them. And so you start to get from this uh, automatically, you're going to the next one here, you're going into heavier atoms. So let's see a little bit about that. So in the star, you get the uh, fusion, and the fusion can lead to some of the higher uh, elements. So stellar furnaces make atoms. Hydrogen uh, has the fusion reaction to helium, and once it exhausts itself, it becomes a red giant and eliminates the Earth. And uh, in the last 10 billion years, only 2 to 3% of the hydrogen has even been turned into helium. But in the red giant stage of stars, and which is one of the uh, stellar life cycle stages, they make oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, uh, neon, et cetera, all the way up to iron uh, in the periodic table. Uh, even that is down here. But they make them in ever smaller quantities. So as you go up the complexity of the atom, you get smaller and smaller numbers of them, which follows as if Pareto's distribution, not the uh, normal distribution as we call it. And in fact, I have a series of uh, theories in hierarchy that talk about the placements of the power law distributions versus the normal distributions relative to the unbroken sequence of systems origins. So as we go back, uh, we're now talking about the gravitational collapse of first generation stars and the creation uh, origins of solar systems. And so this is a, a picture of going up in this direction of a solar system forming where it causes by aggregation, more and more aggregation of things that are captured in a gravitational field by a star. And in fact, I, I said I'm living in uh, Wilson's office right now I'm presenting from it. There's a whole notebook on aggregation here cause he causes it er erythromatics or something like that. It's one of his neologisms um, as a universal isomorphy on the level of uh, formation of solar systems. Of course, now once you start getting solar systems of all different varieties, like we're seeing in the exoplanet, uh, the, they're discovering in specifics nowadays, you get different kinds of planets and different kinds of solar system. So it follows our diversification concept, okay? Uh, and then we continue uh, on certain planets, you get a core, certain others you don't get a core, certain others have a lot of water, uh, maybe from asteroids that have hit them uh, and not. So you get the origin of planet dynamics then, and 
in some cases plate tectonics. So you don't have plate tectonics on Mars anymore because it's an old dead planet. And they've actually predicted when our planet is going to die, when its core and mantle, uh, which is more liquid, are going to result in uh, no movement of the continents anymore and we'll have a permanent uh, uh, actual uh, situation. And, and of course, I have a whole file on origins of oceans. That's another thing, of course. Uh, we turn out to have a planet that has a lot of water to it, and so we've made the mistake that thinking only in terms of origins of life, in terms of DNA and water. So we're looking for water and DNA on other planets, which I say is ridiculous because giant planets could use uh, silicon instead of carbon as the basic uh, building block of uh, macromolecular structures, which then could lead to life. But in any case, uh, on our planet, there was a diversity of independent gases. And of course, in Mars, they've lost their atmosphere to a large degree. Venus has a very hot and uh, luscious atmosphere. Jupiter has high temperatures and pressures, and those are poisonous to our life, uh, but I think they could be a source of life because they have energy uh, potentials. Early Earth atmosphere, if you talk to astronomers, was water, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide from volcanic sources. And chemists and geologists said there was less methane, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, more water and carbon dioxide from rocks. Unfortunately, these groups and these groups have changed their mind. And so the very next step, which I'm going to show you, the origins of biomolecules. Um, but both of these above agreed in the early years that there was very low oxygen. But nowadays that's been shifted uh, so that they think there's more oxygen. Why is that important? Because spontaneously, when biopolymers began to form in large complexes to enable life cells, they, they formed automatically as the motor urea experiments showed uh, in a reductionist atmosphere. Oxygen grabs and gobbles up uh, individual molecules before, uh, atoms before they can get into very large complexes. And so maybe it would cause uh, a problem. I have a whole poster and I've presented at astronomical society meetings about giant planet origins of life, which use silicon as the basic uh, making of a macromolecule and high temperatures and pressures. And we were going to try to do that in the laboratory at Cal Poly because I have lots of engineers actually that I'm teaching now. So uh, from again, uh, there being an integration into local solar systems, you get lots of different stars and lots of different brown matter uh, comp uh, uh, planet systems. And in those planet systems, you can get diversity of uh, some uh, still have continental drift and some still are a, a moving dynamic planet like ours is and some are dead, okay? And then so from that you get a wide diversity of atmospheres like we have in Venus and Mars versus Earth. Uh, but what about giant monomers forming uh, automatically on planets? Well, the old story is the one I taught for 30 years or so so it's hard for me to give this up, is that living system subunits, uh, monomers, uh, become polymers automatically in these cases. And it was the Miller-Urey experiments that showed that you have energy sources like the sun, like storms, like lightning, uh, extensive lightning going through the early reductionist atmospheres, and those are energy sources. And with those energy sources, they cause atoms to combine into much larger uh, uh, molecules. Now crust and oceanic events uh, and even freezing uh, can give rise to these biopolymers. So the next level of integration is on certain planets. There, can, there exist the, uh, both the energy sources and the conditions that would spontaneously give rise to macromolecules. I'm saying that this happens in a different form in a systems way on other planets, and uh, we just haven't even explored that at all.
<clears throat> so from these organic uh, polymers form. So from the diversity, whoops, you get the protobionts, the first cells. And they can happen in a bunch of different ways. We have operins, coacervates, uh, we have uh, fats that don't mix in with water, and so with agitation, they can actually make little vacuoles, micro vacuoles. Uh, you can get dehydrating pools as an alternative. Ocean surface alternative is shown here. The freezing alternative, let me cite my father, who uh, once forgot that he put a beer in the freezer. And um, of course, the beer uh, fluid expanded, and so it broke the glass around the beer. But when my dad did it at that time, and he wasn't a scientist, he saw the beer bottle form in half, and he found in the inside a little concentrated droplet of alcohol. Well, as it froze, um, you got more and more concentrated solutions, and those freeze last, and so it, it tended to concentrate the alcohol. What this told me is that on the planet Earth, which once uh, was entirely iced over, um, on the planet Earth, we could have had the, the early macromolecules that were formed in storms across the world concentrated during a freezing period into little globules. Nowadays, the more popular one is clay deposits. Uh, but in any case, you first had these random monomers that became polymers, uh, but they were later specified by genetics. But how'd you get the first genetic code? Well, nowadays they think that RNA became the first genetic code. So how did the complex biochemical reactions evolve? Uh, one of them is by backward progression uh, of now forward actions. Let's take an experiment that was in, done in 2006 involving the Krebs cycle. That's the central metabolic reaction of all cells. So it implies that it is very, very ancient in its source, and so that's why it's common to all cells that are derived from it up to these days. It breaks up big polymers to make electrons in it, in essence. In reverse, uh, in synthesizes simple biomolecules from carbon. Hello? And two biotic, uh, prebiotic compounds thought to be present in large quantities on early Earth. Originally, could only make it go backwards at 100 degrees centigrade, but Zhang and Martin and Harvard did it at 15 degrees centigrade without enzymes, using UV as an energy source, which of course would have been even more uh, prevalent on the planet because although the sun was smaller in the early days, that's why the planet froze, uh, actually there was less atmosphere to uh, stop the UV light from coming through. So a mixture of ox uh, oxaloacetate with zinc sulfide particles under UV gave the Krebs intermediate step of malate produced. So the CO2, that should be uh, suffix, uh, uh, sub, uh, small two at the bottom here, uh, went up in their uh, particular uh, experiment. So the prebiotic source of oxaloacetate um, from or arrived via meteorites, but reaction yields are, were pretty low for this. So this was published in the Journal of American Chemical Society, and as are uh, many of these experiments. And then you needed to have a high concentrate of life polymers in order to have metabolites. So we talk about protobionts, which would be the first kind of biological organisms. Many of them had the characteristics of later cells, like um, you could get frozen organic pockets I talked about before, dehydration into clays. And then Fox did a whole lifetime of work on microspheres, which are shown here, that formed automatically from proteins that he made in prebiotic conditions. Coacervates, these are coacervates of operin. These are pure coacervates, but look at these coacervates have inclusion of other modules within them. And I have papers which actually showed that you could get chemical reactions in coacervates and concentrations of products from those chemical reactions. In other words, these were acting like little cells even at that time. Much of that literature has been lost because it was during 
the period when I was doing it. So organic mono molecules could form, and then you'd get lots of organic molecules, and then you would get uh, polymers from them and a great diversity of polymers, concentration of these in the protobionts, which I think I went over just now. Yes, I did. So we don't have to go over that again. I, I think I, I skipped going back somewhere. So um, so wide diversity of atmospheres, wide diversity of monomers, wide diversity of protobionts, and then you start getting short metabolic pathways and the first nucleic acid replicants. Now, I've been in this field for, uh, as I said, about a half a century, and it used to be they used to think, well, how did DNA get started? Well. DNA right now is the first thing in what is uh, called the uh, grand sequence of information transfer, DNA to RNA to protein. It goes that way now, but nowadays they think that RNA, simple RNA biochemical reactions with proteins started first. And uh, I actually had the person uh, who did that um, a talk in the UC San Diego uh, uh, things. And then I guess I don't have time. I mean, we've gone through one hour already, but uh, my research focused on the origins of the nucleus. Um, and I hypothesized in my first papers a nuclear nucleoskeleton or nuclear matrix to which batteries of genes attached. Um, but this is after the RNA hypothesis would have happened in the protobiont cells. Um, and uh, matrix associated reactions and uh, what are uh, called scaffold associated reactions are all reflections and research that happened since my time and, and I was rejected because I was dealing with systems hypotheses. This is the cytoskeleton, which is very well established. This is the nuclear matrix, which I hypothesized. And actually we're now seeing there are chromosome territories associated with these. And I think that in the protozoa and uh, in the uh, early molds, there aren't multicellularity because their nucleus hasn't evolved yet. And that includes the fungi. But when you got to animals and plants, there was in this transition period, the evolution of this nuclear structure, which allowed different batteries of genes to be associated for different cells at, at different parts of the cell cycle. In fact, I noticed that this was intranuclear division. The nucleus was stable and didn't have a cycle of reforming every cell cycle. But these organisms have what is called open division, the one you learned like the mitosis in grammar school or high school. Um, and because it reformed the nuclear uh, complex each time, it could reassociate with new batteries of genes, and therefore you would get the many cell types that you have. This has not been proven yet, but boy, it's a very powerful example of an hypothesis that can be formed from the universal sequence, the unbroken sequence of systems origins that couldn't be formed in the local um, basic, um, these are pictures from my lab actually, showing the structure of the protein and the structure of the nucleus uh, sort of uh, dissected. So these are all from my laboratory uh, in the past, the long past, I don't have. Ergo, new uh, complexes uh, and new dynamics could form each cell cycle. And they're, they're completely ignorant of that because uh, they don't think in terms of systems. And so, I mean, I'm not gonna keep going on this thing, but you could have individuals form populations, and then you have diversification of populations. They form communities, you have diversification of communities, and then you form ecologies. But you notice here, I separate the unicellular ecologies from the multicellular ecologies. There had to evolve the multicellular uh, two kingdoms, animals and plants, before you could get what we see as multicellular ecology nowadays. A lot of them do not have this in there. And you could see, I could go and show some of the details about how neural nets got evolved into brains. 
I had speakers on that at the UC San Diego uh, course in 1985, as it turns out. And then you can get a diversity of brains uh, over the animal kingdom, and then different behaviors, and then languages. Languages are a good example, incidentally. Uh, whoops, how come that did that? Supposed to go to, uh, yeah. Language, you can see the great diversification that happens. You have agricultural zones that have a common language like Anatolian, possibly from Patel Hyuk, but this is what happened to languages on the planet Earth. And you can see the uh, basic form of uh, fragmentation and diversity automatically in this. And so our languages on the human level are showing exactly the same isomorphic uh, diversification that you saw on the other levels. So 52 derivative languages from the original uh, Indo-European, and that's only 6,000 years ago. So we've gone in our tour here from um, 14 billion years ago to 6,000 years. I often ask my students in the sciences or actually my courses, uh, like the biology of aging and the biology of cancer were often interdisciplinary. So we had none scientists in there. How old is human civilization? And it's amazing that these college kids didn't know. Uh, 10,000 years is the uh, basic uh, idea for the beginnings and the uh, derivations and fragmentations of our culture. So only 10,000 years. And for the home human species, uh, you could ask, and it's uh, tens of thousands of years, uh, maybe 40 or 50,000, uh, to about 2 million for the origins of the human species. Um, so anyway, in terms of, of people and languages, you get a lot of diversification and you see that on, uh, and we can do the same thing for gene sequences nowadays in terms of populations. And we do that all the time. That's why we know that uh, you and I probably have uh, several uh, Neanderthal genes uh, as well as others. So at that time, I got tired of doing all of this. And so I stopped doing the, uh, the uh, idea that uh, you could uh, specify an integration diversification cycle, uh, an unbroken one. But uh, I could uh, go further. I mean, this has happened not just for languages, but for memes in our brain, for cities. Uh, you get different city states. You could talk about federations versus the breakup and fragmentation of the federation into national units, which in fact is happening to us right now. Um, it's very interesting. Um, and you could do it for a lot of our artifacts like uh, religion or our theories. Remember electricity led to many different concepts of electricity until they unified this and integrated into the theory of mag electromagnetism. And at this point uh, in our mental system series, remember we had uh, shown that uh, you can go from physical to living and living to social. So this has an element of sociobiology in it, which some people find offensive, but uh, I think there's a unbroken sequence of systems origins from the beginning to the end. Now, it's the same thing that goes for theories. You get, right now in system science, we have many different theories. What we're looking for is an integration of them. Uh, and some people are, pursuing that. So let's look at some conclusions. This is a great story, as vast perspective and stunning. I'm pissed that I started this in 1970s and did it consistently through half a century. And now people like David Christian are getting funding from Bill Gates in the millions of dollars to do what he calls great history. And he's an historian of Russia. Uh, basically, he is taking a lot of these results, just as I have done, it's the results are all their scientists, Nobel laureates and uh, hardworking scientists who've done their entire life work uh, on this stuff. Um, and uh, they're saying it's a new thing, that they just came up with it. Um, there's detailed evidence for the continuity. Uh, we can actually show how qualitative differences disappear or explained 
or generalize them enough from the particular so you get isomorphies across all of these. Empirical evidence exists for the bridges across the gaps. This is a really important one. Most scientists only work on one gap. Like Miller Urey got the Nobel Prize for looking at the origins, the spontaneous origins of biopolymers and monomers, first monomers and then biopolymers from early earth conditions. Uh, so spontaneously going from a physical system to the roots of the biological system. But there are a lot of others that I showed you empirical evidence exists for bridges across the gaps. That's why I call it unbroken in the first place. And the other thing that's important to this is we have a systems emphasis. So it's difficult for the reductionists to move beyond the particulars to the generals. In fact, they're not allowed to do it in using the scientific method. But it's easier for people like systems people who are seeking universals. So there's key insights and discriminations that happen along the way though. Um, this uh, unbroken sequence develops a unique, unique and highly restricted definition of emergence, which is different from the word origins and self-organization or spontaneity. Um, and we continue this. Uh, we look at new scalar origins, as the new scalar levels as milestones. Um, only hierarchy theory talks about the scalar levels or allometry theory, but it's uh, not evident in many other pursuits, but it becomes very important here. And I wish, I don't have, uh, I only have pictures of my slides and I can show you the difference between an emergence level hierarchical levels and subspecialization levels that happens after post hoc, after the emergent level uh, occurs. Uh, take for example our cells. Uh, once the cells became mature uh, and were abundant, they started fragmenting or uh, diversifying in the types of organelles that they had. Uh, and uh, that be that's what you might call subspecialization. And that subspecialization makes for the 200 cell types in our bodies. So anyway, this USSO also proves with evidence that the universe is made up of system, uh, proves the, uh, the spontaneous origins of the next level from the previous one. And it leads to empowering questions. Uh, I often love the uh, sentence, the medium scientiae questio prudens. Half of science is asking the right question. Um, and uh, it focuses on binding, what is common to new binding that initiates each new integration. I hope Tom Marzoff is listening to this, or at least he will listen to it when it's uh, on uh, YouTube, because he's big on binding. Are you there, Tom? I am, I'm listening. Oh, that's cool. So. Uh, you emphasize binding between uh, parts and you can see that the binding changes from one level to the next because you're dealing with different parts. But the whole idea of the unbroken sequence is that uh, binding uh, emerges, new bindings emerge for each new level. I might say that uh, since Tom is in the audience here, that Tom has been arguing for these to be types of systems. I'm showing that they're all systems, but I don't call them types of systems. I just call them entities in the universe that the various conventional sciences recognize. But there's arguments both ways. They could be called types of systems too, uh, because they are new levels of systems. So what in common causes of the diversification? What couples the ID cycles together? We tried to show particular evidence, but is there something that couples them together Otherwise, and that's what the next two hours is about, it's the theory of emergence. Because uh, if I showed you those uh, integration diversification cycles again, I could, I could say that the going from the diversification fragmentation to the integration is an emergent act. And there is a commonality to how that happens, uh, I think. Uh, or I proposed anyway, that's a conjecture, you might say. Uh, and it's this theory of emergence we're gonna cover the next time. So the same ID scheme also illustrates isomorphies. 
Uh, it involves cycles, oscillations, dualities we're going to see in the theory of emergence, origins, and self-organization events, all of which are isomorphies in my um, theory. And uh, it involves counterparity and concrescence. Uh, I called it metacrescence in one of the papers in 1985 that for some reason, uh, oh, incidentally, is uh, in the audience, uh, is there George Mobus? No, George isn't on there. Okay, but um, I'm going to send him the metacrescence papers, um, basically. It also shows similarities across what conventionally is thought of as totally different things, physical, biological, and social systems. So this uh, supports a general theory of systems and sets up formation uh, of a proof for the general theory. Um, you know what uh, Hilary Salito told me after looking at parts of this? Hilary's probably not on in the audience, huh? No. Uh, Hilary's from the United Kingdom. He said, you know what this shows me is that there are a lot of systems in the universe. And a lot of the systems engineers thought that systems only involved human beings. And uh, this gave uh, an entirely different uh, perspective on systemness in the universe. Um, and uh, so we also uh, see it from these 15 unseen isomorphies, I have a list of them. So I'm going to conjecture that there is a process theory of emergence which describes every integration. And I'm going to give it to you uh, in the next segment. We're almost done here so we can have a discussion. Um, but only if you compare the changes from integration to the next diversification to the next integration, and then abstract sufficiently. And so we still need rules for abstraction and de-abstraction to make sure that we are doing the correct job of going to the generals, uh, the universals from the particulars, and going back from the universals to try to uh, engineer our specifics. And again, this is only possible if you observe across all disciplines and bring them together. Uh, and this breaks the rules of normal science. But this does prove the universality of systems, as I was saying, uh, uh, Dr. Salito uh, uh, recognized from looking at this. And I think it's all due to statistical thermodynamics and the dominance of entropy in our universe. Remember, uh, entropy is what happens. We lose uh, usability of energy as it goes through the various systems. And uh, I anticipate that something like heaven, the reason we can't figure it out is that it doesn't have the second law of thermodynamics, and so it doesn't have time. Entropy is what causes our sense of time, and we've measured it in lots of different ways and got it down to oscillations in certain atoms and so on. But the fact is, is that entropy and entropy decay gives time's arrow to we human beings. And it's seen throughout this thing as the universe is cool. So I've given you the integration, diversification similarities between natural and social systems. And basically this provides a unification of the natural and social systems. And with that, I'm done. Thank you, Peter, again.